The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome today to our um, first webinar. This is a, a run of three webinars around um, using digital um, to attract, retain students throughout their academic and career life cycle. The first one today is around the role of digital in acquiring and clearing students, and we're really lucky today to have uh, Paul Fennimore with us. Um, who is an expert in digital marketing, marketing as a consultant at Sitecore and also an associate lecture, uh, le lecturer in digital marketing at Oxford Brookes University. Um, I'm going to hand over quickly to Paul because we've got a lot to go through today and I hope you all enjoy it. Great, thanks very much indeed. Well, good morning everybody and uh, thank you very much indeed for joining this uh, webinar today. I hope you find it useful. It would be useful to get your feedback at some point in the future as well. I know this is a particularly important and um, busy time for you guys um, because um, you've just been going through the clearing process and getting through the aftermath of that. And indeed, uh, that's why we felt we, it was timely to be able to pick on this topic whilst it's front of mind and it was something that you guys have been struggling with or, you know, trying to um, exploit, um, depending on uh, where you are with using um, your technologies and your people processes to be able to exploit um, the, uh, the clearing process as such. Um, so first of all, I thought I'd, I'd just give you a brief introduction about myself. I work with uh, a software company called Sitecore, and if you don't know who Sitecore is, we are a, a Danish software company and we're the market leader in a, a digital marketing platform and we work in collaboration with our partners to be able to deploy this in a way that uh, enables universities to really extract the full value from a digital marketing platform and clearly EduServe, given their name, is one of our uh, leading partners we work with in terms of helping to um, exploit the full potential of digital with our mutual clients. So I'm a consultant with uh, Sitecore working across EMEA. Um, I also do a lot of training um, to our partners and also to our clients, um, prospective clients and existing clients on the possibilities as to how you might be able to apply uh, digital in its latest forms to achieve your overall business marketing and operational objectives. Um, I suppose this is a bit of a a throwaway term evangelist, but I, I like to think I am a, prot a protagonist of, of digital marketing, and I, it, it's, it's, it's a passion for me. You know, I've, I've spent a lot, the last few years putting a massive investment of time and energy into really trying to understand um, where this is going and the value it can deliver uh, in a practical way for organisations, um, particularly in the uh, higher education market. I'm also a lecturer. I hope that's doesn't, there's no conflict of interest with you guys as well. I've recently uh, agreed because I was approached by Oxford Brookes University to be an associate lecturer there. I have done research with them before and published papers with Emma and Henley, uh, particularly around social media in, um, in that context. Um, so that's why I'm a bit of a published author. So my areas of expertise are, are in all those things to do with digital marketing. Um, which are kind of endless. I wouldn't consider myself to be a guru, not at all. Um, anybody who says that they are um, should be shot down in flames because there's too much to know to be all-knowing, if that's the definition of a guru. <laughs> um, so, you know, really, I'm about helping organizations doing anything from understanding what the possibilities are and how digital marketing and technologies can be applied to achieve your uh, overall objectives as a business um, or as a university in this case. Also to, to think about how we can just, um, what, what the optimal strategies are, because I don't only just work in the university sector, I work across all vertical markets, and quite often we can, we can um, cross-fertilize ideas from different industries um, and, and learn from those, so maybe I'll bring something to that today to the party. Um, and then I work with clients once they've decided to go and use digital marketing in its full potential to, to make sure that they are doing about that, uh, they are doing that in the optimum way, and we have uh, roadmaps um, for the adoption uh, program. In other words, once you've got the technology and you've got the systems and people and processes in place, how do you make sure you're extracting the full value of it? And um, that's what I do. So that's enough about me, really. So let's move on to the main topic of today, which is about clearing. And it's, 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 it has to be a little bit more about that, um, doesn't it? Because clearing is not something which stands in isolation of the, of the student journey. Things happen before, and a lot happen after. A lot happens after, but um, the clearing process. But it seems to me that clearing is becoming increasingly important. And we will be having some polls a bit later on. So par attention, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> uh, I don't lecture in French, by the way. So uh, it'd be useful to be able to get your feedback on some of these three polls we've got. So it'd be good to. Um, 
to take a view as to where you are with uh, your clearing processes and how you're applying digital to this. And that will be the emphasis on, on these three polls that are coming forward as we go through this 45 minute um, presentation. This is a slide uh, which I've just found the other day, um, earlier this week. So it's interesting that universities are starting to um, to drop their, their grades for, for clearing in order to get um, higher volumes of students to participate and join uh, and to meet higher quotas because I understand that your, your quota levels have been relaxed somewhat. So there's obviously pressure on you as marketeers and the other things that you do um, uh, to, to try and get more and more students to enroll with your universities to make sure you've got um, the various uh, fees that you need to sustain your university and to get the right caliber of students to get the right ratings um, as, as a university and as a uh, academic institution. But it's interesting, this, this is kind of worrying to me in a way, and I'm, I'm sure it is to you, if this is actually true, that universities are dropping their grades to actually fill places to get income. I think I think that's a worry to me because what that says is that there's could be a knock-on effect in three years' time when people start to graduate. If you haven't recruited the right caliber of people to suit your university and the courses that you're delivering, then three years hence, maybe you're not getting the grades that you want. And if you're not getting the grades that you could get, um, because of what you did when you went, put you relaxed the rules when people went through clearing, then that's going to impact your ratings. Arguably, um, it'd be interesting to see what your views on it. That's trouble with webinars; we don't get a lot of interaction. By the way, you, you are able to ask questions. Um, so, in terms of the the tab at the top right hand side with the go to webinar, please please do ask questions, and uh, we will field these. Um, at various intervals through this presentation, and if there's some really good ones that need to be addressed immediately at the end, then we can address those. So there will be a Q&A session at the end if we've got time. And if there's some things that you want to delve into in more depth, a subsequent to this webinar, clearly we'd love to have a one-to-one a -one chat with you about that. About that. Anyway, come back to this topic. So that's the backdrop in terms of clearing that we're finding ourselves in. And um, so. You know, some research that was done by um, Crunch uh, recently. In fact, it was not. It was it was last year. In hindsight, I have to say, but it probably got um, exacerbated. These situations that um, are highlighted by these bullet points on this slide has probably got exacerbated, not not um, lessened over the last 12 months. And it's interesting that um, that. Uh, that it seems that clearing is becoming an increasingly important part of the process of recruiting students, but are we recruiting the right ones? Um, and the one concerning thing here for all of us is that whilst it's 20% um, of um, increased year-on-year -year number of students who are offered courses through clearing, so that's that's a significant number in anybody's terms. But the the, the issue is that we know that students, uh, being digital natives, Y generation, net generation, call it what you want, will be going to your digital properties, whether that's social. Uh, be looking at your emails um, and your web um, uh, referral sites, student sites, the, the, finance, the, the Sunday Times, top 120 list of universities and all the other sources they go to. But they definitely will be going to your website as a, as a first port of call, won't they, um, to, to determine whether in fact um, this is the university that they want to join. And um, this, this, this piece of research which, which was done by Crunch, uh, over a number of universities during this period, uh, it's quite telling. Uh, over 50% of traffic was due to a loss of budget. So uh, that, to me, is an oxymoron in a way because if, if you can get the conversions, if you can get the right caliber of students uh, and the right um, level of investment from these students, then they, it, it's it's a false economy not to put the right level of investment into your digital properties to attract those people and to enable them to self-serve as students and get information what they want in order to be able to then take it to the next stage of progression and, and become a student there. So that, that's a worrying backdrop. Um, and a little bit of research that substantiates the point I've just made. This is a piece of research that was done by Sheridan College, um, who one of the one of the leading polytechnic institutes in Ontario, and they've got about uh, I think it's about 18,000 full-time students. Um, and they did uh, some research last year, and uh, clearly, of all the people they researched, over 2,000 applicants, uh, they saw that 75% of the respondents considered the institution's website to be uh, a major factor, you know, a, a, decif a decising uh, moment in terms of their journey to decide to whether they're going to enroll or not. 
Um, so if you go back to the previous slide that said, hey, um, you know, 50% are, are bounce rates um, on, on the websites when students are looking to evaluate your universities, but conversely, they're saying it's the most important thing when they are considering a university, then there's a, there, there's a, a deficit there that we need to address, and I'm sure you recognize that and, and desperately try to do something about it. But, you know, 70% indicated that the institution's website did have an effect on their perception of the institution. Of course it does. And in fact, that's the way digital natives now communicate, don't they? They expect to be able to get the information in the moment. Um, using digital properties, so that goes back a bit that. Um, now the other point here is that whilst we're talking about clearing, uh, and Tim did mention earlier on, we will be having other webinars that talks about the whole, you know, um, journey of the student during their life cycle, right from attracting them through to being part of the alumni and getting them to sponsor and research your institutions and remain part of it and recommend it and refer it, become advocates. We know that the clearing process is, is just a phase, um, you know, it's four months during the year where you're trying to attract those people and it's a bit of a scramble, I'm sure. Um, but the point I'm making here is that whilst we are talking about clearing, there are things that very much go before that and after it as well. And uh, I'll be touching on that today, but also we'll be talking about that in more detail about those other phases in the journey in the subsequent webinars and more about that later. So the point I'm making in this slide is that there's the stuff that comes before it, the stuff that comes after it that you need to do and you are doing to attract the right caliber of students and get that level of engagement that you require to give them the confidence and trust to want to sign up to your universities and to maintain that relationship from there on and inwards. Um, and actually, uh, one of our clients, the Royal Navy, do this particularly well. Um, so yeah, you know, they're a government institution and they don't necessarily recruit the same levels of um, students or, uh, and um, volumes of people as you do. Uh, I think they have to recruit something in the region of about 3,000 new recruits every year. But the pressures on them is that they have to um, you know, they're not able to recruit the same volumes of people because they're on the budget press pressures. Therefore, what they need to be able to do is to recruit the very best, the right caliber of people. So when they do come on board, uh, no pun intended, um, that they are there and they are going to deliver and they're going to have an eye impact, a high impact on the Royal Navy. And, and clearly one of the things that they do particularly well is using all their digital properties in an omni-channel way. Um, also, um, therefore, when I mean omni-channel, integrating that with the, the bricks and mortar world, with the, the, the digital world as well. And they do an excellent job of knitting those things together and identifying prospective recruits way before the stage that they are in their life to actually join the Royal Navy. So they identify people who may be in the cadets or are members of yachting clubs or have expressed some interest in, in, in the sea, you know, and have got a passion for that. Um, and also flying helicopters, so it would seem as well, of course. So they are absolutely brilliant at using this omni-channel capability, knitting together the physical world with the digital world to be able to identify recruits very early on in their life stages and nurture them, not in a manipulative way, to nurture them by a way of entertaining, informing, educating, supporting them to a point where they are in the position to join the Royal Navy. And at that point, they know these people and the, and the, the potential recruits know the Royal Navy, so they know that they're getting a win-win situation, they're getting the best recruits, and those recruits are passionate about joining the Royal Navy at that particular point in time. And I, I thought I'd just show you that slide by way of example, uh, albeit that the volumes that they're trying to recruit are a lot less than most universities, but the principles and practices that they put in place are very impressive. Um, <clears throat> so a lesson to be learned here. Now we've got a poll coming up here, so we're going to move on to the bit about um, how important clearing is. is. Is there no change? Is it slightly more important or is it much more important? Now, are we able to get this survey up here at the moment? Are we able to get the poll up, guys? So, the, so sharing the... Um, Should be up now. Yeah, can you guys... So everybody should be able to see that. Oh, yeah, the, 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 the votes are coming in. And Good. All right. Excellent, fine. So we, we just let that we, we let the, um, uh, the delegates, the participants here um, have a couple, of, have a minute and a half to actually think about whether the where clearing is um, in their minds and whether it's becoming more difficult or more, or more important. All the evidence suggests, from what I've just covered, that it is, 
but um, it's nothing like hearing it from the people who are actually living it from day to day. And if it's becoming much more important, then we need to recognize that and think about how we can use digital technologies and the people and processes required to make it more important uh, and to actually work it. Um, I think it's a very interesting point, Paul, you talk about in terms of um, getting the right caliber of people as well and, and the quality in there. Um, do you, have you seen any good examples of, try, of people trying to um, improve that and track through maybe some more context, so trying to understand where people are, when they're returning, and how you can sort of really fine-tune your, your, your messaging for them? I have, yeah, and in, in, in point of fact, um, later on in this presentation, I'm going to uh, cover an example of a, uh, a university in um, Canada who I think is doing an exceptional job of doing this, and that's about that's about uh, having the analytics to know who your prospective students are when they come online, mm -hmm. and having doing your market segmentation and personas really well, and then providing them with the relevant real-time dynamic content to get that engagement, so you get those conversions, you take them to the next stage of progression. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking a, little, a bit more about that, a lot more about that um, once we uh, get on to the next stage of the presentation. So yeah, uh, Rotman University is a stand-up example of an organization just turning corners around that. And, uh, and there's also new entrants, of course, who are doing that extremely well, who have completely different business models. I'll be touching on that in a moment. Um, so how are we doing on the survey? Okay, well, we've got a share here, so um, well, I'll, I'll allow you to speak to it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I can't actually see it, um, so let me see if I can okay. see that. Can you share that now? We're looking at um, the, the, the biggest one is much more important, which is coming in at uh, 45%. Right, yeah. That's um, what I would expect. And then following up from that, slightly more in, important, 27%. And uh, with 27% with around no change as well. So around a quarter seeing no change, but three quarters um, either seeing a, a bit more important or, 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 as I said, around half saying much more important. Yeah, right. Well, that, you know, so that, that you know, so that's what what's that saying to us? Is quite simply, um, <clears throat> and it's blatantly simple. There is that you know, some somehow or other, we need to be able to use digital to be able to grapple with this capability during this sort of pressurized four-month period. Um, because whether we like it or not, and whether we think we we need to do what, things like what the Royal Navy does, what we need to be able to do is to recognise that's how it works, um, and to be able to respond to that, and to make sure that there isn't a 50% bounce rate on your digital properties, and therefore students bouncing off and getting frustrated, or having to ring up your help desks uh, unnecessarily, so and getting frustrated in that process as well. Okay, that was a good poll then. So um, be good to publicise perhaps that information. Um, so I thought I thought just on this point, moving on then. Uh, thank you for that poll. Um, people participating in that. I thought I just mentioned something oh, about. So we, went, you, we might need yeah. to just try and reshare your um, your presentation again. All right. Okay. Can't see that. So let's. Can you see that now? Yeah. Yeah. We're back. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. I forgot about that. So there we go. Um, hello. Hello. Yes, we can, Hello. we can see it. Oh, yeah, no, I just, uh, it all went blank there for a moment. <laughs> so, how, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, it, 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 all right, that's fine, excellent. So, I, I, I thought perhaps it was worth, in, t in terms of clearing, then clearly it's important for, for people to be able to pounce on this and have the methodologies in place to be able to um, exploit and manage the volumes of clearing and provide the relevant context and information to those prospective students and to, to complete the transaction through to recruitment. But against that backdrop, um, if, if universities aren't doing that successfully well, then I, that there is an argument that, um, that students will increasingly, uh, so given perhaps some of the fees that they're being asked to pay as well, look at alternatives. And we know that there are alternatives being offered out to them now, and they're starting to emerge, and there's new business models occurring in the world of academia. And um, Udemy is something that I, I, I should imagine you guys who are listening to are already familiar with, perhaps perhaps not, they're not um, necessarily that visible here in the UK. Um, but there's no t two ways about it. Here's an organization which is using uh, digital technologies to, to crowdsource education. So they, they're getting individuals, academics and practitioners and universities um, in the whole 
ecosystem of academia to be able to create their own courses, which are accredited and formally um, recognized by universities and, and um, academic institutions. But what they're doing very cleverly is crowdsourcing um, um, uh, knowledge, basically, and enable people to be able to create their own courses and then publish size, um, um, deliver them uh, and publish them on, on, on Udemy. And um, so it's, it's a great way, a great example of an organization crowdsourcing um, knowledge and using it to good effect to create and share um, those skills in the form of online courses. And this, this university was only, in, it is, well, if you want to call it a university, I suppose it isn't really. It's, it's an online um, learning platform um, which is um, socialized, it's democratized learning platform. But despite the fact that it, it's only been going for about 10 years, I think it was set up in 2010, so it's a bit longer than that now, isn't it? Um, well, no, it's um, five years. I've got to get my maths right. They've already got 7 million students and they're offering 30,000 course alternatives. So if, if you, traditional universities aren't the path of least resistance and organizations such as Udemy are, then we've got to recognize that there's new competitors out there in the world who who, who don't necessarily have to go through this clearing process, who, who are finding ways around it and they've got these new business models that enable students to be able to participate in a, in a less painful way and a way that suits them. So that's a great example of, of um, a new business model coming into the academia world and perhaps taking students away from traditional universities, arguably. I know I'm being a bit controversial here deliberately, but to prove the point, because it is happening, and we, we need to be cognizant of it. Um, and here's another example, and as many. Um, so this is a, a new, uh, a relatively new um, university, um, the Western Governors University. So this is purely online. Um, and they can deliver these courses anywhere around the world. And in fact, they use intermediaries, I believe, in the UK that take the, the online courses that they, um, they create and white label them here in the UK. So that's interesting. Um, and it means it offers a lot more flexibility, doesn't it, to those students because they can do it um, in, in a way that suits their own particular lifestyle. And this is not just vocational courses here as the, as the previous one was. This is um, you know, formal academic um, uh, courses as well. And this university, I believe, was uh, started up around um, 1997. So it's just been going for about 20 years. But already they've got 60,000 um, currently enrolled students and more than 50,000 graduates. Um, so, you know, in the last just under 20 years, they've arguably taken away students that otherwise would have gone traditional to traditional um, academic institutions. So we need to be mindful of that and, and to make sure that we get things like the clearing process really working very well in order to give, up, give the students the, the path of least resistance to finding the right university in a way that they feel comfortable and giving them information to make informed judgments. So that's all well and good. So how are we doing this? Well, it's complex, isn't it? And I, you know, my heart goes out to you guys. I, you know, I work with the um, a marketing department, at Oxford Brookes University, where I'm a just started to be an associate lecturer. I have lectured there before, as I mentioned, but um, they're trying to formalise that now, and that's been done. Um, and hopefully, I'm going to be working with their marketing department as well to help them understand how, in my experience, some of the things that um, we need to overcome and not get completely blinded by. I have to say. So this is a slide which was created by Gartner and I attended a presentation at one of those symposiums last year and they were talking about the enrollment opportunity in terms of the technology map. Now, um, I don't expect anybody really to worry about this too much. That uh, it's The point of this slide, the message of this slide is that it can get very confusing and very complicated in terms of using digital uh, for this enrollment or clearing process and if you're not familiar with the hype cycle uh, the, the, the hype cycle, or hype, hype curve, that's quite interesting because what that is saying is that there are always technologies where initially there is this initial hype um, like social media, um, like um, perhaps Twitter and Facebook and um, mobile apps and whatever it may be. There's always this initial hype and people get carried away with it and really you know, hope that it's going to actually to help them transform their organization and then the reality bites in and, and the hype goes down and they feel a bit depressed about it because it's not delivering against the promise because it's always a bit more 
that difficult to implement than they otherwise thought. And then after a while, it stabilizes, matures, and these technologies start to deliver. And we can see green here will be things like CRM enrollment or service-orientated architecture and business intelligence. And um, obviously, gray um, is well established now. That's gone beyond the hype, and that's things like using um, social media, of course. And we know that's um, central to any. Um, communications and student uh, engagement process that uh, universities are now adopting. So you know, the point of that slide is that it is confusing and what I'm going to try and do is to help help us stand back and think about well actually it's not that complicated when we think about what we're trying to do. So um, you know, this slide is taken from the world of uh, the commercial sector but the same principles apply to academia I would argue and, and what we're trying to do in order to make sure we've got this clearing process before and during and after working really well, what we're trying to do and those who study marketing and you guys who are actually in marketing from day to day will recognize this but sometimes we get bogged down in the weeds and forget about you know, high level and standing back in terms of what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, this is what we're trying to do, but during the clearing process, we're trying to do this in a very condensed way uh, in a short period of time, but we can do it. Um, and what we're trying to do is initially make sure that we, we're able to harvest the information and start to build up a, a single student view by getting this customer intelligence or student intelligence and starting to profile them, know who they are, what their interests are, what particular topics that they're interested in studying, whether they're a, a star student or not, um, and where they are, what their location is, and whether they're a high value or low value international student or otherwise, and what they're worth to your organization. And, and digital marketing platforms do this now. Sitecore does that, picks up this information, and builds up a profile of any interaction any student might have with your digital properties. And I keep using the word property because I'm not just talking about website here, I'm talking about omni-channel marketing, so that's mobile, um, it's about um, email, it's about social, and it's, of course it's about your integrating your CRM, your transactional data, with your unstructured data as well, with your social data. And the system does all this now without you having to recruit legions of staff to make this happen. Because I know, you know, you guys in, in the world of academia, quite often there's only a couple of you, if you're lucky, um, doing this, you know, this digital bit. So you need a technology that automates things and makes your life easier as opposed to um, you know, building a Frankenstein system bolted together in different technologies that makes your life impossible to do this. So the other thing what we're trying to do then is to be able to, having known who our students are, is to be able to communicate with them in a real-time interactive multimedia way that we can measure um, uh, with no geographical boundaries and with infinite reach. So this is using um, Web 2.0, isn't it? That's the, the um, you know, the social part of it in many ways is the ability to be able to interact and have two-way digital conversations, but to be able to automate that, because you can't do that, you know, you're clearing and emissions teams can't have thousands of conversations every day because there's a 50% bounce rate arguably just at the moment, hopefully that's not happening to you guys, but what we need to be able to do is to make sure that your students or your prospective students, when they come online, um, they're able to get the information they want, they're able to self-serve, which means they're happier because they get the information that they need to be able to make informed decisions and the right decisions about your institution. And it means there's less burden on your organization to have this mad panic period whereby you're having to field lots of information, maybe physically uh, with your help desks and service centers to be able to do that. So this is making, this is making digital your, 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 best, your best communicator to your, your students um, before and after they become uh, and during as a, uh, through, through that life cycle. And then this is about engagement. So the last piece, what we're trying to do is to, th having known who they are, being uh, having the capability to be able to create content once and publish it anywhere across all the digital channels, is to be able to then having online digital conversations um, in an automated way that sends relevant content to those students based upon their their demographics and psychographics, preferences and parameters, and to weave these three things together to be able to then 
get advocacy, and in your in your case, it is you know it's, it's to be able to acquire and convert them during the, the clearing process. Obviously, retention and and you know other things later will be in our subsequent webinars. So if we get lost down in the weeds and think about Christ, we've got all these different dis disparate technologies. And how the hell do we do this? Well, at the end of the day, that's that's what it boils down to: getting the intelligence, using the technology to be able to communicate, and with relevant information in an ongoing way. So engagement is, is about personalized content on your website it's because you know who people are and what they're looking for when they come onto the site because you've got this intelligence already. It's about then also having ongoing engagement plans, so things that trigger off social media messages or email uh, messages which are absolutely relevant to those particular individuals. So you're having personalized conversations, but it's done in an automated way. And that way you get your conversions. And that way you're serving those people immediately. You know, they're getting that information during this compressed period of, um, <clears throat> of clearance. So, so that's all well and good, but um, what we need is a plan in place to make that happen. And we're coming up to a poll now. So um, let's see if we can get ready for the next poll. Um, and this is about, okay, so we're going to use this technology, but how do we make sure it's delivering against the promise? How do we best apply it? How do we make sure we're, we're applying the technology to meet those, um, those marketing and operational objectives, making money and saving money, I suppose. So we come on to the next poll here. Um, here are the questions. So are we able to get this poll running, guys? Yeah, just one sec. There we are. Can you see that, Paul? No, I, for some reason or other, I can't see it, but it doesn't matter. I've, I've got the. Um, so, if you could just talk us through when it, when we get the results coming through. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I just wondered whether um, you've seen any um, changes, I suppose, in the, in the in terms of the importance of the digital marketing or, or common strategy in relation to the overall business strategy. Um, and whether you see a digital strategy in terms of being able to help bridge that for organisations looking at digital transformation. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really telling question. It's a great question. Um, and that's why I think we've got this poll here to see whether that bears out what I'm going to say. Maybe <laughs> whatever the poll says may be contrary to what I'm saying. But, you know, I, I deal with organisations across all sectors. Um, and, and what I'm seeing is, a, is a, pivotal, a pivotal point just at the moment where I think Board of directors, um, you know, the main stakeholders in corporations have started to recognise that, that that digital is central and pivotal now to the success of their organisation, and it's now not an IT project. It's now not a middle management marketing project at an operational level where it's just running a series of campaigns, and it's not just about a website. This is about transformation. This is about having a strategic digital plan that's aligned to the overall marketing communications plan at the university that then drives that university meets its business objectives and operational objectives, you know, whether it's reaching new markets, new audiences, launching new um, courses sooner rather than later, getting better engagement, improving customer sat um, student satisfaction and experience, and managing that whole process. Um, but but the, 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 there's still a big but. Whilst there's this recognition and the lights coming on, I'm seeing that there's no real plan because because people haven't done this. They haven't set out. They haven't really gone down this road before and putting a digital strategy together. So they don't know what the road map is. It's not not a well trodden path. And, and this is where we come in because I work with many organisations in helping to set out what that path should be for their organisation. So they learn quick and implement quick and um, perform successfully and get some quick wins in there. So there's a turning, I think we've, we're have we coming to a tipping point here, mm -hmm. I have to say. That's good. So how, well, we, we, we've got the poll results up now as well. And 67% okay. um, are coming in with, uh, we have a strategic plan aligned with our overall objectives. And um, around a third, 33% have a, a tactical plan. Um, but thankfully, thankfully, no one says we don't have one. So that's yeah. Well, I mean, that, that that kind of substantiates what I'm saying in a way, and I'm really delighted that um that we have a that they have a plan. You know, 60 odd percent have a plan to achieve their overall objectives because that will deliver results. And it's the, the other point, though, I would argue is is to, is have you got when you, with your plan, have you got the right level of investment? 
Um, so I deal with organisations who say, right, we've got a plan, and we're putting you know two hundred thousand pounds into it, um, but there's no return on investment, there's no business case being put in place. So arguably, they should be putting two million pounds into it, not two hundred thousand pounds. So are they putting the right level of investment into it and are they able to measure and get the attribution from the return on investment? So that's the next step. It's, 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 it's not only having it aligned to those objectives, but also making sure it's the right proportional level of investment that actually really is going to deliver. So yeah, but that's really encouraging and I'm, I, that kind of verifies the fact that I think we are on a, a tipping point in this respect. So now I'll show my screen again and we'll move on. Thank you everybody for, for voting. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, all right, perfect. So, so I, I'm just going to sum up how I think some organisations are, are putting together um, a digital marketing strategy, um, and also uh, how they. I'm going to be talking about that in another webinar. How you can put a, an objective business case, return on investment model together that substantiates the right level of investment, and to be able to measure that and review that accordingly. So you guys, and, and this is not me teaching, to, teaching you to suck eggs because I understand that you know this already, but when you're putting any plan together, um, you start off by understanding where you are in your, in, in your market. So you understand what the current situation is and you might do something like a pestle analysis, like acronym could be rearranged in any particular order, I, and you would do a market audit and a SWOT and you would look at some of the threats, like I've just mentioned, new entrants are coming into the market. And out of this, you start to formulate a um, a digital marketing plan or a plan, an overall plan for the, the institution and you'll look at some of your primary corporate objectives and by the way these are up there by way of example, I'm not saying they're definitive but they're by um, well, just to well, you know, proof. Well, I'm just sorry to jump in just to say we can still see the poll slide, I'm not... Oh, so that hasn't moved on? No, sorry. So I don't know why that would be, uh, let me see still see the poll slide. Um, show my screen. What, what can you see now? Yeah, sorry, I can yeah. see your pointer, but it's still the poll slide. What, can you see that now? Ah oh, yes, there we are, thank you. Alright, thank you, yeah. Alright, I did click show my screen, but obviously it didn't work. So, so the point I was making here is that you, you do this you, you, you do this evaluation as to where you are in the market and where you want to go and you look at your overall primary business objectives, corporate objectives and it could be you know, things like attracting the right students, increasing income, increasing research in, uh, grants and all these various things you, want, you would want to do and they're stated no doubt in your charter as a university. And, and where we tend to, to fall down sometimes because we're working in this whole new world of digital marketing is this correlation of um, of marketing goals and how they actually drive those overall um, uh, university objectives. Um, and, and I think this is the bit that we can work harder on and what we're able to do is this bit of attribution because I put this hash sign in terms of these kind of marketing goals because now we're working in the world of digital, we can track, trace and measure it and we've got this um, elusive problem that we've had previously of attribution, measuring the outcomes of our marketing activities, we can now do that. Um, and we've got this uh, concept of engagement values and scoring and we can see what conversions we're getting with our, our digital marketing campaigns and our overall omni-channel marketing uh, and communications activities. So, so you know, these marketing goals, uh, and no doubt this is what you're doing because you now, 60 odd percent of you said that you, you're aligning your marketing goals to these overall um, uh, university objectives, which is fantastic. And I've put one up here for, for clearing as an example. So one of those would be that they want to attract the right student profiles uh, and increase enrollment. Well, you know, focusing on clearing and how many more people can they get through clearing? How can they reduce the balance rate that um, was previously mentioned? So this last um, roll up here um, in terms of this animation arguably is what a customer experience or student experience platform would do. It's not a definitive list of all its capabilities and competences, but if you've got a unified platform, this is what it will comprise of. It would have experience management, give you an opportunity to optimize and manage that, and to do that in an omni-channel way. And so that's primarily around the technology and obviously it enables you to put, implement processes, but then of course you need the people to measure it. And um, I, I think where technologies, perhaps like uh, technology companies like Sitecore have failed before in the past is that we haven't helped you understand the correlation between 
the, the capabilities of this technology, which is most useful and usable now, um, there's a real return on investment on it. The correlation between this capability and your marketing goals and the overall um, institution objectives. So let me give you an example about clearing. So what you want to do is to increase enrollment and income, but you want to get the right level of students, and you, you might do that during the clearing period because everybody's saying that's becoming increasingly important. So how do you do that? Well, what you do is, and no doubt you are doing this, whether you're doing this in an automated way, I don't know, but clearly you need to increase the capability because that's what you've said. Um, we're seeing what we're able to do within our, our digital platform is to, to look at personas and do our market segmentation. So we start to be able to define what students we want to attract. We start to want to um, know whether we want to pick particular students or focusing on a particular courses and topics they want to study, uh, what caliber they are, um, whether high value, low value, where they're coming from, what geography they're coming from. And what we're able to do then is to optimize dynamically visitor journeys um, on those digital properties to make sure they're getting the right content using our rules-based engine. So this engine here will say, if this student is looking for a course in digital marketing and they want to do that in Liverpool, um, and they want to um, get finance, and also they're coming in from India, whatever it may be, then th the content will recognize this based upon those criteria. The rules will say that this is this journey. It recognizes the implicit and explicit behavior of that particular student. Show them this information. So that gets this conversion. What you're able to do using um, our database that we've got now, the, the Mongo XDB, but you've probably got your own, but it's harvesting all this information all of the time, and what we're able to do over a period of time is to pick up a, a single view of the student or start to build up their profile, and we can get the analytics to, to help us understand who they are and what customer journeys they're going on and how we can optimize that. And then we've got this concept of goals and engagement values. So as we as they go through this customer journey, we're able to measure and trigger particular goals that says that if they've downloaded a video or signed up for something or rang up your help desk or triggered something that takes them on that journey for them signing up to be a student with you enrolling, then you can measure the that journey and the value that journey is bringing to you and to that student. So there's the attribution. And then what we can do following that is to have these ongoing personalized engagement plans. So if a student, you know, on a particular part of that journey um, is particularly interested in um, more information about um, the, the module, um, the module guide or high level module guide on digital marketing, they can get that instantly. So the system will say, right, based upon this condition, if they're interested in that particular course and they want um, the module guide, then send it, send it to them via email and then in two weeks' time follow up with another email uh, to say, how did you get on, did you want to speak to us about it, whatever that engagement um, profile is. So this is knitting together all the, what historically has been disparate technologies under one unifying platform to make this a seamless process. So you don't get that bounce rate and you do get those conversions. And then you can do this multivariate testing thing so you can optimize content very easily with machine learning. It will say what, what's working, what isn't working as people go through those journeys. And you can do this without lots of technical staff because you don't need to be technical to be able to create content and set up these rules. Um, and you can do this across all these different channels. So a web to print is an interesting one. I know um, that some universities now, you know, publish out um, brochures based upon the um, explicit interest that a student has expressed by visiting the digital properties. So if they're interested in an MSc in digital marketing and they want to find out more about it, they will get that curriculum, not a big thick brochure. Um, or prospectus on the whole university, but something which is personalized to them, which gives them the right information that they require, but also saves the university on massive print costs. So it's, it's, that's where you get the omni-channel capability. And of course, you start building up a picture of, of the student because you're, you're then integrating the system easily with your CRM system, and you start to build up this profile of the student, which means you can build an engagement plan and start to have these digital conversations with them to get those conversions. So we can see here, we can build up this profile. This is a profile card, or we call it the X, X file, X folder, experience folder in other words. Um, so the system's harvesting all that information. So when somebody comes online, we, we're starting to build up this 360 degree view or even 180 degree view of what Peter is and what his interests are. Um, 
and we can see according to pattern matches because we put these profiles of segments within the system so it tells us who he is uh, that is an undergraduate and is particularly interested in biosciences um, in terms of a profile we've decided that perhaps we've got different personas that we've got here one there could be multiple ones and we his best matching in terms of his behavior is that we know he's a star candidate because hey is um you know his, his, his a level grades are just outstanding and as an international student so he's probably worth more to us than, than other students in that context and we can see his behavior you know things that he's done um, and also we can see the value that he is, is worth to us and his behavior online as well. So number of visits, what he's been looking at and what call to actions he's done. So recent campaigns, what has he responded to? So he's, he's, he's found, wanted to find out more about an open day, day for science students. And also he's, he's inquired about financial uh, advice for international students. So that would be a trigger in your engagement value that I was talking about earlier on. If somebody's asking for information about that, and you're able to service him online and giving him that information he requires, you're getting him closer to that conversion to then going through that clearing process and making a decision to go with your university. And, and it builds up all this information. You don't have time to go through all of this with you today. And we can build up a profile card within the system that enables you then to have a, a, this view of this, this student to be able to then get them through clearing much more efficiently, make them feel happy and confident uh, that they're making the right choices. And um, there's, there are organizations starting to do this. So um, uh, Canada tends to be uh, a country where they're a little bit further down the line with the adoption of digital marketing and communications just by the nature of their, um, their country, you know, big vast country um, uh, with a, a smaller population. So the best way to communicate with people when you've got that kind of geographical landscape with people who are deep, dispersed and digital becomes a great way of communicating it's a very cost-effective way so these this organization needed to do stuff so they got this disparate technology um, the, the, you know the bounce rate was high um, they didn't engage with them and there was no integration with their CRM system and um, so they needed to do stuff so using the technology that I've just mentioned they did excuse the blurry slides here, I took this from one of their videos that they showed the other day. They started to do simple things like testing, um, so rules-based testing on particular content um, and personalization based upon geography or number of times they've come on site. So if we know that they, this is the third time they've been looking for um, doing a course in, in the arts and we know that it's the, their particular, they're coming in from India or whatever it may be, we can start to show them personalized content immediately rather than having to rummage through um, a cumbersome website which makes them feel that you know, they're self-serving rather than having to uh, call your institutions to get the information that they want. Because they're digital natives, they expect to be able to get the information online immediately. Um, and then to be able to do rules-based personalization, as I indicated before. And so some of these simple tests that they started to do were things like, hey, um, you know, applying for your MBA, this is one example, and the system, you, you don't need to worry about all of this to the left here just at the moment. But they, they did a simple test saying, um, so your path to MBA, start your application today with one variation. And the other variation on the same theme was uh, your path in the MDA, explore and connect and apply, apply now. So th th the fundamental difference between these two is one was shorter, this was test A and this is test B. Um, and the revelation to them was um, this test when they started to run it over a given period of time and it was, you know, they, they set it up in 10 minutes. You can create this test in, in 10 minutes. You let them run for whatever period you want and then the, the computer system, because it's machine learning, will tell you what works. They found out that test B was actually significantly more successful than test A. Um, which was a surprise to them. So what they, to what they told them objectively with the information to prove it was that um, simplicity was better. And we, we were talking about bounce rates. Well, yeah, a 17, just through doing simple personalization, sorry, testing, not personalization yet, they decreased bounce rate by 17%. So, you know, with a minimal amount of effort, they were able to eat into that dis discrepancy. Um, also, what, what they were able to do, I mentioned analytics earlier on, was to be able to see the behavior of students as they were coming online and therefore provide them with relevant 
contextual information based upon their explicit and explicit behavior. And what they found was that when people were coming online, what they were looking at as they navigated through these journeys was the first thing they were interested in was how much does it cost? You know, can I get in and how much can it cost? So those are the, those are the pages that they were hitting and quite often it took them some time to get to those pages on the website to make that happen. So they realized they needed to make that a priority um, and it made that more accessible to people coming onto their website. So based upon you know, the fact that they are a new student, they're making an inquiry, show them this information straight away um, for the first search, you know, not the, the fifth click before they get the information, and then send them off in the journey, ask, I'm giving them information based upon their um, subsequent clicks. So that, that started to work really well for them. So this doesn't need to be rocket science. The second thing they realized that from the analytics that um, students were interested in looking at when they were going perhaps through the cleaning process was, okay, I can get in and how much does it cost, but why should I choose this particular university? So send them off um, once they've come back again and they're looking at the why, send them off on the journey, personalized journey, which gives you, um, which extols the credentials of your particular university rankings, financial times, feedback, and so on and so forth. So that was straightforward. It didn't take much time to be able to put that in place, but the conversion rate went up. And the third thing they recognized from the analytics that students wanted to do was, um, what will I learn and who from? So they're not guessing here. They know this objectively from all the analytics they get from the system, um, straightforward information. So, you know, th three simple things. So then send them off on the personalized journey um, and um, send them into the faculty and, tell, and, and nudge them towards the content and the courses that they want to promote. So if, some, if they've got a particular course that they wanted to pro promote more than another one, then maybe nudge them to the MSc or, you know, I don't know, something in, in marketing as opposed to e-business uh, perhaps because we realize it's more relevant towards them. So that started to work really well as well. Um, so, you know, whilst it sounds very complicated and impossible, not for me, it, that's not the case. I, I believe there's only just two people in this university responsible for marketing, uh, and this is a, a, a top business school in, in Canada, I have to say. And the other thing they started to do, which was a little bit cleverer, um, this is for the MBA course, I have to say, so it's not necessary for undergraduates, of course, is that the system will recognize um, the URL that somebody's coming in from, and looking at the website, um, and when they recognize that it's the Bank of Canada URL, uh, email account, then they show them information pertinent to that particular um, place of work, and they say, hey, if, if they are coming in from the Bank of Canada, and they can recognize that because the rules engine picks it up, show them information pertinent to that particular business school curriculum, which is to do with a financial MBA, perhaps, and also it shows them um, people who've previously come from their institution, um, from their bank, who've actually gone and done um, their MBA there, and also tell them perhaps that they maybe didn't know this, that they're the vice president of the university that, um, is also the, the CEO or um, uh, one of the chairman, yeah, it's the chairman of, the, um, of their bank, and they maybe they didn't know that either. So this is building up trust, it's giving the information they want, helping them to make informed decisions taking that on that journey. So very simple things that started to make a massive impact and they're doing this with no more staff. They haven't needed to recruit, you know, legions of staff. So guys, we've got this poll next. So, so to what extent are you using testing and personalization techniques along the line that I've just, uh, I've just um, uh, mentioned so perhaps you can take a look at that because these things are simple to do. And what I'm finding is that people aren't are doing it but quite often they're doing it manually or it's too difficult to do because the system's not up for it. So it'd be interested to get your feedback on that. How are we doing on the on the poll here guys? Um, well it's, it's coming in with uh, around 50% not at all right now. Uh, we're just, we're, we'll leave it open for a little bit longer. Yeah. Who else comes in? I, you mentioned digital native quite a few times, and it seems to me that students have a far greater expectation from universities now, not just in terms of the quality of the course, but how universities communicate and, and support the students. So, do you think the change in how students like to be communi communicated with is is understood by within the sort of senior levels of the universities and the impact of that? 
I think, again, we're turning a corner. I think, Jim, you know, it's a great question again. I think historically they haven't, but now they recognize they've got no choice in this because, um, you know, I, I was at university. I did my master's only five years ago, and, um, you know, I was communicating with my cohort, cohort, cohorts even, I get to say that, um, via uh, social media and not using email at all. Um, so if, if that's where students are hanging out, you've got to talk to them in the places where they're hanging out. Um, and in recognition of that, I, I, I've seen, I'm seeing universities now starting to have a social media strategy. So that's really important. And yeah, you know, students, because they are digital natives, born into the world of, um, of the net generation that they expect to be able to communicate um, with their universities digitally. And if they can't, I think it gives them a negative perception of that university, that, that university is not on the case. Um, so yeah, I think that's, the, that's a really good question. Well, we, we have the results up now. Um, a third coming in at, at not at all. A third coming in with uh, occasionally, but it's a manual process. And then a third coming in with, uh, we use testing and personalization tools for some content. Um, but no one seeing it, uh, no one currently who's using personalization and testing um, as, as key to their digital strategy. Yes, and that, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. And, and here we have, is a, is a very simple thing to do. I've given you an example, haven't I, with the, um, with, with the Roman University who've just started to do this and get some very significant um, results. And um, I, I would say that um, the principal reason behind it is that historically the technology to do this was clunky and it didn't integrate with your website easily or your social media sites or your email sites. And, and there's this problem of legacy technologies where uh, all organizations, it's not just universities, of course, have got these disparate technologies and they're not integrated. So it makes testing really, really difficult. Um, but I think, that, you know, nowadays it's, it's, the technology has moved on. You can do personalization and testing very simply without, using, without having to go to your IT team, team to get into HTML or to be able to, um, to, to, to size up. Yeah. That really is an important part, isn't it, is, is the fact that you want to be able to keep this in, in the hands of the marketing teams, make it simple, make it quick and easy to do. Um, so in the last five minutes, um, we're sort of running low on time now, so it, um, we'll, we'll pass back to you. Uh, currently we can see the poll slide still up, but um, we can move on. Yeah, there we go. Importance of mobile. Back, back to you, Paul. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So this is... So, you know, this is building on your question, Tim, about, you know, digital being really important and clearly mobile being vitally important. Um, and uh, it's doing, doing all the things that I've just mentioned that um, organizations can do. You can do testing and personalization, of course, but you've got to be able to do it in the moment where they are and what they are doing. And, of course, the way you do that is, is to do all the things I've just mentioned, but to make sure you're able to render that out in an optimal way. Um, and to have your, your content which is optimized and adaptive for those digital uh, mobile platforms, whether it's a tablet or a phablet or a phone or a smart TV now, etc. cetera. Um, and simple things like, um, this is Exeter University um, who are using this uh, for their open days. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when you go back to university, I mean, you're working in universities, they're, they're massive places and difficult to find your way around. It can be quite intimidating. So having a simple mobile app when people do come to your open days, um, or even just to, you know, pop along and find their way around university, it can be quite intimidating. Um, and also when you join university and you're finding your way to lectures, I know that I turned up to lectures late because I just couldn't find the room. Um, so if you've got a simple mobile app, and this is not rocket science, that is using the same content that your other properties are using. So you're not having to create specialist content for this. Create content once and publish anywhere. And you could do this on your mobile device. And I just put that up there by way of example because no presentation such as this could be absent of the importance of mobile. So it's being able to make sure that you've got the capability to render adaptive content which is optimized for mobile devices. And again, this is all automated nowadays if, if your digital properties whatever that may be, are not optimized for mobile, then clearly you've got a problem, but I suspect that most of you have overcome that by now. Hopefully you're doing this in an automated way and not having to, you know, create manually content or revamp content to be optimized 
for your um, mobile devices and creating your own apps I mean, there's no two ways about it this is really important and this thing this Exeter one I love it you know if only I had that when I did my masters that would have made my life less stressful <laughs> at times running around the campus trying to find my um, um, my map you know and location as to where the um, the course was running but that's that's even before I mean I was at Oxford Brooks the other day and and people were showing the new students um, the, the 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 campuses and it was you know crowds of people walking around a massive campus and I'm not sure how much of that stuck in so you know this is just following on really beyond the clearing process but when when students see that you've got an app like this when they are going through the clearing process again it gives them some confidence that you're on the case and you're digitally savvy as an organisation I'm sure you would agree um, so that's just a, a yeah simple but great example of of making that happen. Um, and then this, uh, I don't, I don't go need to go through that. But they actually also use it voting. So again, this is getting feedback all the time from students. So um, and getting ratings not just at the end of the the year or at the end of the the, the the course, but getting feedback from people all of the time, to, so they can tune and tweak things on the go. And that side is just saying that the students loved it. That's all that's saying. Um, and then the use of social, social. I mean, there's no two ways about that. We know that social is really important, but um, so many, um, so many students apparently were clueless that they didn't, um, that their chosen university didn't even have a Twitter or Facebook account. So some things that could be remedied very quickly to be able to do that. Um, and uh, overall, there is a drift, of course, towards universities moving rapidly to using Web 2.0 to get that those digital conversations through those social channels and what you, you should be able to do is to, wherever you've got your content um, in that central um, digital asset management repository or your media library as is the case within Sitecore, you should be able to create that content once and then publish out that again to your mobile and to your social sites so you haven't got again to uh, employ additional people to make that happen and you've got consistency of messages and imagery and branding across all your all your channels as well. Um, that that's important. And this storytelling idea, which you can do over uh, uh, digital, is great. And you know, I don't know how far you've taken it, guys. But um, here's Washington University. I know Liverpool University. I think it was Liverpool. Uh, Nottingham. I think we've got somebody from Liverpool on. I started to use things like Second Life. That hasn't quite worked, I don't think. So despite you know all my advocacy and you know evangelism about this whole new world of digital, some things don't work too well, but it would be useful at some point to know how you guys are using um, virtual communities, virtual worlds like Second Life, but on principle, I, to me that sounds fantastic, so if I was going through clearing and I wanted to find out more about the university, um, and say I'm a foreign student, but that doesn't matter, you know, I, you know, I could be up north and wanted to go to university in London, um, and never been there before in the past, but if I can go around and do a virtual tour of that university, that just gives me that extra bit of information and comfort a reassurance about the intimacy, understanding who that university is, um, but that's a tricky one. I always think the second life is a bit spooky. You kind of fly around. It's almost like being on psych. You know, it's, it's like being on hallucinatory drugs when you're on second life. Um, anyway, just to round off then, because we're on time, I think um, just a little bit more about how I work with EduServe. Um, so we have we have a pretty good website ourselves. I would have to say, I'd ask you to download our book. Um, which is about putting a business case together for all of this because as I said earlier whilst we're, we're embarking and turning embarking upon this journey of employing digital really well uh, particularly for clearing and other things as well you've got to be able to show your investors your um, your board if you want to call them that the stakeholders what the return on investment is and I have a, a really great methodology now for calculating um, in an objective way what the return on investment would be for your people processes and technology for your digital strategy and, and a very comprehensive ROI calculator that I use with EduServe to be able to then put a, a, a P&L together and I know marketeers on financial guys and accountants but I, we can help you with that uh, but have a look at this ebook uh, just go onto our website and type in ebook and you'll find it and we run some workshops with with EduServe things like the possibilities so um, you know, how, what's the latest and greatest with the digital technology and how does it apply to our university and um, where are the priorities and where are the quick wins and what strategies should we adopt so we run workshops or programs or one-to-one -one consultations with universities in that case um, 
to, to formulate, help them formulate a strategy that everybody gets consensus to. And then this business case thing is really important. I think that digital marketing's turn of age, you can do this attribution and I can help you do that with EduServe. And then once you've got it, once you start using this, um, the technology that you've already got is to have an accelerate program to be able to get some quick wins and then ongoing relationship with you guys to make sure that you're you know, delivering against the promise that you've given people when you've put that business case together. So we do that through consulting, workshops, training and online services in collaboration with, with EduServe. And here's one example I did with um, one university not so long ago, in fact it was probably about eight months ago now, decided to go with Sitecore. Uh, this is not a sales pitch but you know, it is in a way I suppose. Um, and this was the headline and some of the objectives, looking at the possibilities. So to get a level set, so get people from different functions within the organization, not just in marketing, but maybe in legal, um, emissions, um, uh, you know, uh, finance. Um, one of the workshops I had, it had a, a whole cross function of people attending and to get a level set and a common understanding about what the possibilities were of digital and then to get this consensus and collective buy-in as to what needs to be done to get that impetus to make it happen which is part, always a problem isn't it guys trying to get um, the organization to get it you know uh, you get it but it's always a problem helping you get everybody else get it um, and then to set out a plan you know to, to follow up on some of the things they want to do to exploit these poss possibilities so um, I think I'm just handing over to, to Tim now in terms of following up. Well, thanks a lot for that, Paul, and I, I hope everyone found it interesting. Um, so yeah, obviously we're, we're, we're slightly well over now, but um, just a couple of dates for your diaries. As we said, this is the, the sort of first of three um, webinars, so the, the next one will be looking at um, how you can use digital to help postgraduates and sort of build up that alumni. Um, and then, then in January, we've got one focused really on uh, international students as well, which is an exciting one. We will also put both Paul and I are at um, University UK Digital Marketing event down in London as well on the, the 13th of October. So they're happy for you to come along and, and, and join us there. And thanks for your time. And uh, I think we will leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>